Welcome back, everyone, to episode two of us playing as a Realm of Kiri. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover. But we gotta talk about checked balances. Autumn Blaze crumpled up yet another piece of paper in her magic and turned it into ash with a little frustration, channeled through her horn. She'd been stuck in her office all day because she couldn't find the right way to dra word the draft of the bill in front of her. She was about to set it aside and try again later when the door to her study opened and her brown Karen stepped in with a fresh stack of papers for the premiere to look at. When the newcomer saw Autumn's exasperation, however, she paused in the doorway and frowned. Autumn, is it a bad time? Autumn sighed and waved the Kieran. No, no, no. Sitting her glow, it's not. It's just, I've been beating my face against a table for Concord knows for how many hours now, and I've gotten basically nowhere with a new constitution. Sitting glow, bit her lip and step closer. What's the problem then? She has the premiere and the party leader. Read it out to me. Maybe that'll be, that'll help you all figure it out. Uh, I'll figure some things out for us. Well, it's worth a shot at least. Autumn took a deep breath, sat up right and pulled, her, uh, pulled out her stack of notes. I've been trying to work every Kieran's concerns into the new constitution, and that's going fine, I guess. Executive power over matriarch or court, and the reform bureau is pretty cut and dry. The morning secretariat's legislative abilities are fine, too, but that's the whole thing with the courts. Back in the day, legal disputes were settled by priests who determined which party Concord favored, but you can imagine just how big of a problem that could easily become. Karen and his allies just want to import Griffonian judicial law wholesale. But Griffonian society is entirely different from Kieran society. How can we just import that without considering our own heritage? And of course, when Frost wants things to stay exactly how they are, you might just have to favor one or the other as a starting point for the bill, Sinaglo offered. Either use a way of fire as a basis or Griffonian law, uh, and then work backwards from there to reach a good enough compromise uh, for Kieran society. I definitely favor one side more than the other, but finding a compromise that makes everyone Kieran happy ends up making no Kieran happy, right? Griffoni has a modern judicial system. We can start there and work backwards. The way of fire is inseparable from Kier's society. It should be the basis. I like the stability, but we kind of need the political power right now because I'd like to celebrate the Mid-Autumn Festival. Get more political power, stability, lose some more, uh, lose some, not war support, but factory output. But, but we also get more stability too in the end. Overall, I think that's pretty much worth it as we reassemble the banners. So if you read this one, please go ahead, which I read last time. Uh, open up the ports would be nice. One, two, three. You get three naval dock characters, which is pretty good. Architectural geomancy, monthly population, transfer speed, resource efficiency gain, better consumer goods. Uh, let's see, encryption, decryption, research speed would be nice. Ah, uh, numero numerological divination, divination, Vermilion armada, mm. all Kieran Collegium. Uh, where this one last time too? If you read this one, please go ahead. I guess we're, and I also read reset all Kieran returnees too. So, Road of Vermilion. The road that once connected Vermilion with the rest of Concord's realm has long since been overgrown, only to their disuse during the silence. Using priests to recruit local laborers of the cause, clearing and reestablishing these roads will be crucial once more unifying the realm under Matriarch's superior rain shines rule. A quite happy night. On a blaze, pause outside the door of her full home, home, fall hood home. Having just finished dinner with her parents in a long, long, long time spent catching up with everything she had accomplished since moving to Vermilion as Matriarch's premier. Her parents have been thrilled and ecstatic about her accomplishments as ever, but even for the ever talking of Autumn, she needed a little bit of time to herself to relax her mind and take a break. So, spying the hell she used to slide down in the winter, Autumn turned towards and began to canter up its grassy slopes, humming to herself a little as she trotted. It had been exhausting the last few weeks, but everywhere in Mascot, the decorations hung from the buildings and strung between rooftops served as an easy reminder of the fruits of her labor. She just finished a chaotic two weeks of trying to organize the mid-autumn festival as a national holiday, a task that coupled with her usual duties, had left her mentally drained by the time the matriarch had given her permission to return to Mascot and celebrate the festival with her family. The festival was in full swing, the streets were filled with music and singing and laughter, but away from the town under the full moon, the world was quiet and peaceful. When she climbed the hill, however, she was surprised to find her friend Fen Flair, Fern Flair, sitting there, having a picnic dinner as she watched foals chase each other through the meadow with paper lanterns while their parents were relaxing nearby. She didn't so much announce her presence as she did, did trot over to Fern's blanket and flopped down on it with a groan, but Fern only chuckled as she offered Autumn a mooncake. Busy day premiere? Please, for the love of Concord, do not call me that tonight. Autumn groaned, taking the mooncake and biting into it. It was delicious, just as she remembered it and put a little bit of energy back into her. But having Fern use her official title made her frown. Fern, you ever feel like there's a huge weight on our shoulders that's going to crush us flat if we take one wrong step? Because I do. All of Kira is depending on me to hold things together. I'm the one standing between the happy night and civil war. I have nightmares about the planet of interrupting into a chaotic inferno of riots in the streets of our homes burning to the ground. In fact, that's a lot, you know. It's just almost too much for one mayor to bear. Well, it's a good thing you're not just one mayor, Autumn, Fern said. We're all with you. You've got the matriarch on your side. You can do this. If there's ever a mayor for the job, it's you. Then she smiled at her. Now, come on, cheer up. You don't want to be thinking about your job during the festival, right? You're right. Thank you so much, Fern. Also, since uh, pre-release, since I played the uh, you know the build before the actual official release, I love the addition of these little items here, these little pictures. Fantastic. Fantastic. The more stability, we could do that, but we don't really need to do that right now. Um, our political power is good to have. Let's see what we can use with the banners of a vermilion. 
The rain shine stood uh, in the massive plaza of the open air of Verdigris Rotunda, outside of the Imperial Palace, counting the numerous colorful feathered banners fluttering in the slight, slight breeze of the dreary day. A small drizzle had settled over Vermilion, and two of her palace servants used their magic to keep the rain off her regal body, but then the Kieran assembled in the plaza before her stood stall. Stood tall, stoic, and proud. Some were young, barely more than colts and fillies. While some were older, their skulls weathered and cracked with the passage of time, but one thing drew them all together, and those were the colorful banners they rallied around. And pretty much. <clears throat> Uh, you few, you proud, gallant few, Rainshine began, addressing the crowd with a respectful dip of her head. You are the children, grandchildren, or even great-grandchildren, the last soldiers that served my mother's thousand banners. Your ancestors served well in the thousand banners and were rewarded amply land upon which to start a family when they retired. Their children, their children's children, served after them in the banners. Like my own family, your family became strong military dynasties that will survive the worst the world can throw at them, even something like the silence. Her eyes shifted back towards, out on the plaza, noting all the empty space unoccupied by the tiny gathering of Kieran in front of her. I summoned you here through the Imperial Decree because it's time to rebuild the Thousand Banners of Vermilion. You'll be the first to serve me should you choose to follow in the hoofsteps of your ancestors. You'll be made captains and officers, and you'll protect the realm from any threats, just as your forebears did. There are not a thousand banners standing before me, true, but I look forward to the day when this rotunda is filled with a thousand colorful banners, like a rainbow fallen under the earth. But the first banners, they will be yours, and will be honored by Concord's blessing. So I ask of you, Kieran of the realm, who will step forward and serve the matriarch? She don't have to wait long for a response. One by one, the Kieran under each banner stepped forward, carrying their banners with them for a rainshine to bless with a touch of her magic. One by one, they knelt before her and swore their oaths to the realm, just as their ancestors did long ago. And one by one, Kyria earned, its, ba earned its banners back on the day. Today, 100 banners. Tomorrow, 1,000. Fantastic. Economic policy, nothing here. Fantastic. Weekly change going down by a slight bit, but the power's still looking decent. Oh, uh, what is this? It's not bad. Um, yeah, we'll resettle these guys in the Alkira Collegium. Kira's first modern university, the Alkira Collegium, will train the next generation of native Kieran intellectuals. With the assistance of professors and scholars educated in foreign lands such as equestrian Yale, however, with new ideas come new dangerous thoughts, will we let a professor teach friendly, teach freely, or should be monitored by reform bureaus to weed out radical thought? Order in the court. With the imperial constitution finally written and delivered to every town in Kira, no matter how big or small, <coughs> Autumn Blades had hoped that the worst of the challenges that document that would face were behind him. But while the rest of the realm read and ratified the Constitution, the city of Rhapsody quickly rejected a part of the Constitution relating to the implementation of the new judicial system. After a quick talk with her advisor, Fern Flair, she soon figured out why. Rhapsody has always had this important judicial institution that they're fiercely proud of, Fern Flair explained. The procurate of Rhapsody is this entire system where the priests with the greatest seniority in the city can serve as absolute arbiters and judges in any cases or complaints that they take an interest in. It's a system where right and wrong is decided solely by whoever is the highest in the pecking order and has been entrenched in the city for a long time, even during the peak of Vermilion's power. I can understand why they don't want to let it go. They have to, though, Alan protested. But rounding at the letter of Rhapsody's rejection, they just can't accept part of the Constitution and keep their own judicial system. The Constitution is needed to standardize their laws and practice across the entire realm so it's easier to govern. They can't even proclaim that they're doing it for their way of fire, even when a frost agreed to it, and she's the voice of our religion in Vermilion. In Vermilion, but not in Rhapsody, Fern Flair quickly countered. Uh, pushing this issue could create tension between Vermilion and Rhapsody, just down the line. Might be better let them just have this exception just this once. Once we give it one city an exception, the others will want their own. Rhapsody's friendship is important enough to allow an exception. Tip of the spear. <coughs> There's perhaps nothing quite so refreshing and relaxing as we're traveling the roads of our splendid nation, especially when the roads are freshly laid, no less. It's a humbling experience uh, that truly brings it to one. One closer to Concord is a communion that can be shared with one's company and the Kieran that she crosses paths with along the way. My fellow mystics and I have spent the past several weeks traveling along the new roads laid down in the rural west of our realm, spreading the glorious news about the rising fire and how we must adapt to the tenets of Concord's faith to a new day. The science has taught all of us who follow the rising fire important lessons, namely, that we do not need a pyramidal, uh, a pyramidal religious order to understand our intentions, that we do not need the temptations of the modern age to turn us away from our glory, that we do not need the legal codes and shackles of some foreigners' ideas of governance to run our nation in defiance of Croncord's will. Verdant and Chrysanthemum thrived during the silence because we learned how to properly interpret and adapt Concord's intentions to the century of communal isolation that bestowed it on their own. Common Kieran organized in their communities, each fighting their own meaning in Concord's creations and working together for a truly classless and equal society can do more for Kyria than the way of fire ever could do in the modern era. The doctrines of yesteryear belong to the yesteryear. And they must modernize too, along with the times, if they are, they are a hold sway in the future we proudly strive towards. We have spread the news and beliefs of our doctrines to the countless Kieran on the roads and we have traveled, and we have been repaid amply in kindness of strangers and even by the government officials of our matriarch's period. Wherever we travel, some Kieran is willing to offer us a place to stay for the night at a warm meal, as well as it is well known that to treat one of Concord's priests with kindness and vice or blessings upon your household. And government officials all give us alms and gifts, encouraging us to continue to spread the word about the end of the silence and motivate the populace to rejoice. 
Though most do perhaps mistakenly, they believe that we are priests of the old tenants of the way of fire, not mystics of the rising sun, and doubtless we would get into heated confrontations with them if they knew the truth. Most officials from Vermilion and I have gotten to know are fairly dogmatic in their old beliefs. It would not react well to any cure in professing something some would see as heretical, but what they do not know, we will not harm them, and it will make our lives easier as we continue to spread the word. We have enlightened many converts today, but just as we did the day before, and will continue to do so tomorrow. We are the forefront of a movement, the tip of the spear, and the fruits of our labor will only one day be sweet to savor. Until then, we must do our best to make sure Concord's true divine will is heard throughout the nation. Absolutely. And we'll do this one next, and then we can eventually open up the ports. We could lose even more political power for this, but... A Vermilion Armada... Priest for a banner. Army experience game would not be bad. Organization. Uh -huh. Well, we'll definitely do this one next. Road to Vermilion. The roads that once roamed connected Vermilion with the rest of Concord's realm have long since been overgrown. Owing to their disuse during the silence, using priests as a recruit local collaborators or <laughs> laborers to the cause, cleaning and reestablishing these roads will be crucial to once more unify the realm under the Matrix Superior Rain Shine's rule. The last sunrise of sunrise. Matrix Superior Rain Shine retreated to her city after lunch, a worrying thought pricking at the back of her mind. Ever since Ember Wayne had come to seek her recognition for the banner of the covered cage, her thoughts were troubled by what her premier had said and what that meant for her realm. Had this paramilitary group really been operating without limits and without checks for this long? It bothered her that she soon knew, knew so little about them. They were apparently organized by her mother and had been operating under her command for decades. Now they claimed to be loyal to her as Kira's ruling matriarch. They could be useful, there was no doubt, but Anna Blaze had made it clear that working with them was a double-edged sword and would come with their own host of problems. Chief among them. It was a record she found in the tattered scroll that reported on the progress to her mother. Though it was short and laced with jargon, Rainshark was able to suss out the real story inside of the banner's report. A detailed an intervention in the town of Sunrise and how quick and decisive action by the banner had dismantled the heretical society inside of Sunrise. It sounded so clean on paper, but when Rainshine brought it up to other ports and letters that had been sent around the town of the banner's actions, it painted a far bloodier story. Sunrise had once been home to a military sect of the Way of Fire who believed that the Vermilion dynasty had failed Kyria and the Concord should never be so cruel to still punish the entire realm with something as harsh as the silence. <clears throat> Instead, they believed that the Vermilion dynasty had acted out of corruption and greed in the smother Kyria with a silence in its lust for absolute power, but at the turn of the millennium, Concord uh, would bestow a new avatar on Kyria to overthrow the Vermilion dynasty and return Kyria to greatness, and so the town and its inhabitants refused to follow the decrees of the silence and prepare for the new avatar's arrival. By all accounts of the time, what few there were, the city of Sunrise was peaceful and prosperous, open to sharing its wealth with its neighbors, and had modernized its own way, at least until the banner of covered cage descended onto the town. The inhabitants were slaughtered to the last for charges of heresy and defiance of the silence, and the tower town put to the torch. All this the banner done in its name of the Matriarch and Concord, though the sword comes and had become something of a folktale in Kieran society. The emergence of the covered cage would surely reignite these stories and fill the peasants and farmers of Kyria up with outrage. I left Rain China at a terrible impasse. Do you know what she should do about this story of Sunrise and the banner of the covered cage? Should she come clean to her subjects, apologize for the decades old massacre, and condemn the actions of the covered cage? Or should she suppress the incident as best she could in hope of maintaining peace and calm? The realm must come clean about the past if we want to move forward. The knowledge of what happened to Sunrise would do more harm than good. We'll take the hit now. We don't need the political power as far as we know. And we'll get some more too. Oh, wait, why are we doing Road to Vermilion next? Oh, well, I'll do I'll carry this one next, after this one. Because I would like to get down here. It's been about core. For the fire and flames? No, the, for the flame and fury. Point eight's not bad. We're still losing a little bit. And we have a tiny bit of war support. Wow, look at that. How are we looking here? We're doing all right. Concord's will. Praise be to Concord that in her divine wisdom, uh, she has seen fit and to end the silence that has blanketed her realm for too long. The Kieran people have had 100 years to repent and reflect on the sins of modernization that nearly undid all the hard work of the way of fire and unifying your scattered and quarrelsome race centuries ago. And I feel that a society and culture has learned a great deal from the experience. Concord imparted her will to punish her errant children through the matriarch Noctilus and Charm, and now she has decided to forgive us through the matriarch Rain Shine. Now the only question is, do we learn a lesson the first time? During matriarch Charm's reign, uh, unchecked and unfettered modernization nearly collapsed our society as the hedonism of modern conveniences turned a society away from the simple truths of the way of fire. We, our parents, grandparents, and even our great-grandparents, have atoned for these mistakes. As proudly supportive of tradition as I am, and naturally aware of any change that could undermine Concord's divine authority in our lives, I nevertheless believe that we can safely bring the realm out of the silence and into the modern era through careful reflection and consideration of how our choices align with Concord's will. 
We cannot be willing to blindly turn our faith from our matriarch to enlighten, un, light, enlightenment and luxury, for then we lose sight of Concord's vision. Foreigners like Fickle Curran and his capitalists have been born and raised without Concord's guidance in their lives. They are no followers of the way of fire, and they should not be allowed to dictate the future of the Kira society, but their money and innovations can serve Kira and her vision all the same. One example is the expansion of roads that many of our, my fellow priests and mystics have volunteered to organize and lead. All across Rome, my fellow spiritual leaders are recruiting peasants from the fields to repair and renew the roads linking the Rome together, roads that are long fallen into disrepair and disu disuse throughout the silence. It's important work that needs to be done, and this modernization will allow us to once again research Concord's will across the Rome. It's a truly noble project, and just one of many that we can use the tools of the modern time to reinforce our tradition and our heritage, but such a venture it also comes with its own risks. The disconnectedness of the silence was a test placed by Concord to measure our devotion and reward our faith in her, but now that we're reconnecting the realm, it's clear that some have failed the test. Hotbeds of heresy have sprung up in the West, and even in cities such as Verdun and Chrysanthemum, where the mystics and the followers have turned away from the way of fire to adopt the, their own set of heretical beliefs. Connecting Vermilion to these cities is not a one-way street. Just as they allow the matriarch to reassert her authority over the West, they allow the heretics to spread their lies and falsehoods further into the East. Such heresy is unacceptable. I'll do everything in my power to stamp it out before its corruption can ensnare Vermilion. Such is Concord's will, and as one of her priestesses, I, saw, I am her instrument. I will not fail my goddess, nor will I fail my matriarch. I'll be the voice of tradition and heritage that Kira needs me to be for the good of the realm. Thank you, Winter Frost. Hey, I've got more here to put the Vermilion Radiant Slime. Following the lifting of the silence over Kyria, the question of investment into the realm's modernization slowly grew. The influx of equestrian venture capital and generous donations from the Kyrian diaspora equestria culminated in the construction of the Vermilion Radiance Line, a railway the first in Kyria to connect the capital of the realm to the port city of Radiance, historically known as the Vermilion Gateway. Our cost overruns and the technical difficulty of carving a path through the dense and hilly Sakura Forest meant that this venture stalled already. The railroad unravels from modern neo pegaspolian train termini in the hearts of Vermilion and Radiance both only to end abruptly the fringes of the Asakura forest. A little bit of political pressure. We'll breathe new life in the venture to carve a path through the forest and connect the capital to the sea. There's no northern roads. Many roads that meandered through a great realm have decayed through a century of ne neglect and become overgrown with vegetation. <clears throat> Let us lay new and modern roads and reconnect our provinces together and further the great task of modernizing our country. Restore central coastal roads. Many roads that can meander through a great realm have decayed through a century. Oh, these are all pretty much all the same. Cool. This one seems kind of interesting. The first train line of Radiance. They can save a little bit of political power. We're still losing stability, of course. Weekly change is not very good. But still. Bureaucratic bottleneck. Of the all Kira Collegium. Autumn Blades let us sigh of relief uh, and stretch her sore legs at the last of the bills delayed to the foundation of the all Kira Collegium. Kira's first modern university and heavily inspired by academics from Yale finally passed the floor by a razor thin margin. A contentious issue that had turned what should have been a good idea every Kieran could agree on into a parliamentary nightmare had been the university's stance on religion. The university was officially secular and would not make mandatory the attendance of sermons and observance of holy days were crucial to the way of fire. Winter Frost's religious clique had fought tooth and nail to reject the proposed university secularization or the secularism. Claimed that Kieran intellectuals for generations to come and only breed heresy and disrespect the Concord while Fickle Curtin's proposed president of the new school, Cypress Snow, had claimed that the removing religion from the lecture hall would allow new ideas to grow without the shackles of tradition and mysticism to hold them down. The debate had been furious and lasted for hours, and in the end, it fell on Autumn Blaze and her supporters to decide the matter in Kern's favor. The university would be secular, and Separate Snow would be its president. <clears throat> but that had not been the end of it. As soon as the floor cl cleared from the vote, Winter Frost stood up in her booth and put her hooves on the Vermilion rail separating the seats from the plenum center. Are we going to plant the seeds of heresy in her garden? We must at least have some care to watch over it and pluck the weeds as necessary, she began. A motion that the Collegium be placed under the jurisdiction of the Reform Bureau. This kind of right-wing radicalism that Kern and his cronies bathe in must not be allowed to breed at our academic centers, or will have turned our backs on Concord and the Matriarch Superior. Fickle Kern was quick to respond, hopping, hopping to his hooves, only after having taken a seat in the moment's form. You lost a fight over the university, now you wish to cripple what you cannot control? He said, spat back at her. The traditionals control the Reform Bureau. You would stifle our academics instead of letting them grow and blossom. Before Frost could respond, he turned to Autumn Blaze and addressed her directly. Premier, your faction decided the last vote, so put an end to this one as well. Do you know that Winter Frost and her traditional center of this university or the future of the Kieran Literati will suffer for it? Legion must be independent. Reform Bureau will curtail the spread of new radical ideas. <clears throat> I don't want to spend 100 political power. I don't like this one either, though. Hmm. We could take the hit now. Because I don't want this to get lowered. Really. But in the end, I guess it doesn't really matter, you know. Air armor group, less stability, agrarian stuff, less stability heller too. But we do get two civvies. Technological imports. Yeah, that'd probably be good to do too. But we'll open up the ports first. 
The Port of Fragrance was once the most important wall of Kyria, connecting our nation with traders as far as West Grifonia. Fragrance Port was shut down when the silence began, as harbors have fallen into decay. With enough investment, however, we can return fragrance to its former glory. Fragr fragrance can once again connect us to the rest of the world. Absolutely. Uh, we could do that. Or we could do some industry stuff. 373 days. Holy crap. That's a lot. Vermilion Armada. Our once proud navy was mothballed and later scuttled as a result of the silence. We control a large swath of coast around the eastern Zebrica, uh, yet we have no navy to control it. We must begin to build and assemble a mo modern navy to keep our coastline safe and allow us to project force over the waves that we rightfully rule. Why are we not making any more naval XP? Did we lose? Oh, we lost our ship. Barnacles? Technological imports. If it advances as a nation, we cannot afford to waste time rediscovering technologies that we have long since been perfected in foreign lands. By asking the return uh, Karen Literai for helping supply the nation with copies and examples of state of the art technology, we can reverse engineer designs and rapidly scale up our industrial capabilities in a very short time frame. This should be good. So we're going to lose 4% more stability, which sucks. We do get 3 more dockyards and 30,000 more pony power. So, the first train from Radiance. Rain shine watched with awe as a metal monster chugged into Vermilion. Though she hid under the mask of quiet and dignified splendor, she'd learned to show for the subjects over the years. The newly above Vermilion Grand Central Terminus was packed with occurrence of all trots of life. Jammed so close together that the regiment of Banner Kieran brought on for security struggle to keep the crowd from pushing them onto the glistening steel tracks in the station. Now, no Kieran wanted to miss the exciting event, and though Rain knew that her presence as Matrix was a formality, on media stunt she couldn't deny that she found it all exciting as well. After all, there would only be one first train from Radius to Vermilion reestablishing the link between uh, the realm's capital and its traditional getaway for, along the coast. This moment, mundane as it normally otherwise would have been, meant something fantastic for so many young Kieran and the prosperity of the realm itself. When the train finally rolled into the station, every Kieran pre present let out a cheer and stopped their hoofs for the pony engineers at the controls. As the engineers were escorted out of the engine and fed with garlands, food, and rice wine, Rainshine sincerely, uh, serenely smiled out over the crowd. With the completion of the Vermilion or Radiance line, a realm is once again part of the outside world, she announced, to much hooting and hollering. This marvel is the first fruit of what I sincerely hope will be a bountiful harvest between our humble realm and our generous partners, the ponies of Equestria. Hoof and hoof. I pray to Concord in all of her glory that our two nations will have many more partnerships of mutual friendship and cooperation, such as this one. Then, to the surprise and awe of the assembled crowd, Rainshine stepped forward with an entourage and boarded the train as Kieran engineers replaced the ponies within the train engine. The train whistled as Rainshine's waved out of the window, and the crowd cheered as she made herself the first major experience to ever travel the Rumball train. We're piercing the country back together bit by bit. Yay! Open up those ports. Oh, we can do more stuff down here, too. We lose even more political power. We extend the Hyacinth Accord. Ooh, that'd be good too. We get more cities down here as well. This is good. Riches of Metaflub. Actually, industrializing society active for more than 40 factories, which we do basically all this stuff too, but still. Um, factory output. Cities are good. Riches of the Metaflub. Uh, but we don't have to do that one, do we? Urban-led modernization. We have to do this one anyways. Modernization has been seen time and time again as uh, starts in the cities and trickles down to the countryside. Though our urban centers decline during the silence, we can rebuild them with new infrastructure that can support the modernization of the realm. This will have the side effect of allowing us to draw more care into cities, bringing them to whole new levels of productivity. Absolutely. And develop the eastern seaboard. The Kieran living on the seaboards were almost entirely reliant on fishing to survive throughout the silence. As a result, the eastern seaboards in particular is woefully underdeveloped. We can make use of these scattered fishing villages to cobble together local workforces for new dockyards and shipyards along the coast that will boost our naval production and economy. When do we get this, this guy done? Oh, we have... Look at that. That's not bad. In a few weeks. And we have eight. Not great. But it could be worse. Perfect bottleneck. A lot of letters. We could do that too. We don't have to though. Uh, even though I might recommend doing that, since we lose political power, we get more weekly stability. We get more weekly stability, which is fantastic, because we're still losing 0.3, which is not much. But employing this guy, 0.2, uh, is really helping us out by not having us lose too much stability yet. And welcome back to getting more naval XP. Yay! Urban led modernization. Quite a few days focuses that we gotta do for that one. Oh, we can celebrate this too. But we gotta wait from March to May, so a quiet happy night, huh? So now we get 0.67, but now we actually get more stability, which is fantastic. Uh, so we'll do this one. We're gonna do a technological import next, and then we'll do Vermilion uh, Armada. Because the 20 days focuses is really fast. 
and we're there. Tons of infrastructure. Bunch of factories. We can actually build more cities up here. Fantastic. So we don't have to do this one. It'd be nice, but we don't have to do it. We need more factories. Gunships, Quest Equestria, Surplus. Rifle designs, they're okay. Let's go School of War. Claim Auburn Isle, least one ship in the dock of the Isen. So that's why we need that one ship. Nice. This one next <coughs> We're progressing very nicely. I would do that one too. Geological surveys? That'd be great for more resources. Kiriath is full of untapped potential when it comes to resources. What we produce today only scratches the surface of the realm's potential. We know our hills are full of natural resources, but that's yet to be properly exploited by industrial excavation operations. All I have to do is fund geological surveys to find the best deposits and encourage excavation companies to dig them up. Fire rage from the Auburn Isle. Autumn Blaze skimmed through the last report attached to the Imperial Census of the Southern Coastline before setting it aside. So far, she read 15 reports from the Imperial Administrators. We have visited the coastal towns to take stock of the situation along Kira's coastline, and each of them have been largely the same. Punctuating all the droll figures on the population numbers, tax determination, and analysis of the local economy were reports of pirate attacks and raids. Autumn knew that there was a strong pirate presence in Auburn Isles, where the entire mod of pirates operated out of the port of Nacker, and she'd always been aware that they somewhat regularly raided the coastline for goods and bodies to press into service. But the caveat that bothered her in each of these reports was that they were apparently getting more freaking and destructive. What had once become an irregular occurrence for these towns was beginning to happen with a concerning amount of regularity. Pirate attacks were surely increasing and growing more organized, and the red sails of the Pirate junks had been even spotted prowling off the coast of the Great Melifluve River, searching for ships to prey on carrying goods out of the Kieran Heartlands. It was a bold move given the number of ships that ventured across the waters, and Autumn didn't like that one bit. For now, the pirates were still only raiding small fishing villages and coastal towns and staying clear of the more populated and patrolled locales, but it can be denied that the increasing occurrence of attacks and the wider range the pirates seemed to be patrolling was a bad omen for things to come. If the pirates were growing bolder, then it would only make a matter of time before they started attacking more lucrative targets. And with the realm still struggling to pull itself out of the stagnation, decay of the silence, the last thing it needed right now was a series of pirate attacks destabilizing the coastal economy. Something would have to be done to stop the pirates before the problem spiraled out of control, or the consequences would be severe. We can't afford that these pirates have free reign of our coastline. Absolutely not. Hey, more stability, though. So that's why we have to do all this stuff, and we'll do the Eastern Seaboard next. Even though the Northern Industry will be really good to do too. Trade relations with Equestria changed by a plus 100. Ooh. Seafarer Marines. Because I want to get down to the Auburn Isles relatively quickly, but we don't have to be extremely quickly. Um, the T-House Mercenaries, huh? Nice. Description. Because I would like to get more research speed too. Sequential extrapolation. 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 Hey, we're zero. Not bad. And now it's getting worse again. Cutting it. 15% war support. Not, so, not bad. Not bad at all. We got a lot of naval XP too. Love it. So this will help us out with the resources. Hopefully, people will, will want to trade more. Land of possessions. Well, we're going to come over here. Because we have only 22 factories. A fragrant flotilla, huh? <clears throat> Dredging of old history. Agrarian production. Oh, I'll get more civvies here too. Agrarian consolidation. As Kieran moved out of the cities at the beginning of the silence, they set up a subsistence farming across the countryside wherever they could find land. Most of these farms are small and poorly managed, relying wholly on manual labor to grow any crops. Consolidating the clusters of these farms under one manager and bringing in modern farming equipment will increase their productivity and free up valuable land. For years, ships sailing around the eastern coast of Zebrica have skirted around the isolated coast of the realm of Kyria, avoiding the pirate den of the Auburn Isle by taking their ships out of the deeper waters. But now piracy, pirate activity in the Kieran seas has increased dramatically, and so the tax on foreign vessels. As the realm of Kyria undergoes its breakneck modernization following the ending of the silence, the pirates of Auburn Isle lashed out with a desperate frenzy of raids and attacks, seeming as if they were seeking to delay the inevitable by seizing as much loot as they possibly can. As the problem spirals out of control, it's become increasingly clear that the waters around Ky the realm of Kyria are becoming... Uh, uh, Dangerous, and any ships sailing around the eastern Zebraca should be well prepared to fend off attacks when the situation is right under control. Kira must retain control of the waters. Crap. Well, we're doing the fragrant flotilla next. We're just going to beeline through the side. Sitting at the bottom of the fragrant harbor uh, are three old warships, once the most modern ships in the realm, but scuttled during a sailor mutiny in the city during the silence. God, I want to do this one badly. They've been underwater for decades now, but expeditions have confirmed that they are still in decent condition. Raising these three ships and retrofitting them will also field three outdated but formidable ships in our new navy. This is actually, we have to do this one for three cities, so. Mining Concord's home. We can wait to do this one. The three priests, uh, standing before the symbol plenum, made for an odd sight. Autumn Blaze could tell at a glance that the three, two stallion and a mare, were part of the way of fire or ultra-orthodox followers. 
The clothes and coats were smeared with black ash from countless sacred fires, and one had even tied gunpowder coat string into their name. Maine, though he hadn't lit the spark a few years before making his appeal to the rain shine. Where's our mate? Jurak the mirror among the mass. We seek an audience with her divinity, not with mortal Kieran who claimed to be acting in her name. The plenum is blessed with the Matriarch Rainshine's divine authority, Autumn quickly countered. Whereas assured, however, that all the proceedings that happened in the plenum are brought before the Matriarch, now I'll petition your case on our guests. Though that uh, answer hardly seemed pleasing to the priests, one step forward regardless. This modernization project is, is going too far, he exclaimed, angrily stomping his hoof. The mountains and surrounding Vermilion are Concord's sacred domain. Every single peak and every last valley were blessed by her hooves. It was these mountains which she first crafted to shield Vermilion's fertile valley from the primordial fire that gave birth to the world. And it's these mountains that miners and prospectors defile every day, digging through the earth for material wealth and trampling over the foundations of our theocracy and our society. They must be stopped. At this, Fickle Kern stood up and scouted the three. The mining companies are doing important work that is critical to the Grand Gallop onward, not only that, but they're doing so in a respectful manner. No prospecting occurs within 50 kilometers of a temple or shrine, and all named mountains in the range are free from mining activity. But I feel I must reiterate, Premier, that the resources they are extracting are important for our modernization efforts. It cannot progress smoothly if they were to be interfered with. All the mountains must be declared sacred property, the other stallion priest exclaimed. They're concord by right. Is this nothing sacred? This modernization drive is self-destructive. Cities are consuming the countryside in a cannibalistic fervor that destroys nature. They must be stopped before it's too late. Priests are right. You can defile. Concord's creation pursuit of material wealth. Fickle Kern is right. The modernization of Kira is too important to ignore. I don't want any more support for unaligned. I'm going to take this political power hit, which is not good for us. We need political power immediately. Does anyone give us political power? No? Crap. Rearm. Recommission. Purchase equestrian naval blueprints. Oh, we do have time to develop modern naval ships from scratch, but we do have friends who are already at the forefront of the naval thought. We'll benefit from our former close to ISO equestrian to acquire uh, modern blueprints for ships, weapons, fire control systems, and more than that, will allow us to construct a modern navy. Point 8 is still not bad, but still. Dredging up old history. It wasn't long before the first ancient ships breached out of the surface of the water. Those crooked and splintered masts exposed to the winds of fragrance for the first time in 90 years. Fickle Kern watched as the salvage crews busily set to work securing the rotting wreckage. The tugboats and barges, ready to haul it into a nearby dry dock for repairs and refitting. It was one of the three early dreadnoughts that had formed the backbone of the Vermilion Armada before the silence, and when it was scuttled along with its two sister ships, it had been one of the most advancing seafaring vessels in the world. Nowadays, it would have been horrifically obsolete, of course, but some salvage and retrofitting would turn into a serviceable, if outdated, foundation for a new Vermilion Armada. The history of the ships was something that every full of uh, fragrance knew well, and the current was no exception. The ships that had been taken part of the Armada mutinies out of the sounds was past, and where the sailors of the Armada attempted to seize their old ships, mothball for ten years by that point, and strike into the open waters as pirates, mercenaries, and smugglers, anything to provide for fragrances with the impoverished populace. Soldiers from Vermilion had suppressed the mutiny and retook most of the mothballed ships, immediately scuttling them to prevent a second Mutiny. It was just another insult in the long term, or long list, for the Imperial Capital, and the message it sent was crystal clear. Vermilion expected fragrance to quietly huddle up and die in any attempts the city made to save itself or treason. That humiliation stung deep in the hateful lessons it had taught had simmered for a hundred years, but today was a new day. Like ships from the line returning from the murky depths of the harbor, fragrance was beginning to return to yesteryear's glory. These ships, raised in fragrance and launched from its dry docks, would be the first to safeguard Kyria's post silence maritime interests. Fragrance, just like them, was leading the way for post silence Kyria. And one day, Frag a fickle current hoped, fragrance and all of its children would be given the respect they deserve for everything they sacrificed for the realm. Fragrance will save Kyria, Major Green Shine will best remember that. The scuttled dreadnoughts of the fragrant flotilla will have been recovered and are being restored. Nice. Seafarer Marines. Uh, the Sai Sea Trading House has long employed seafarer marines in Grifoni to protect its ships from pirate attacks when moving valuable goods along the high seas. These marines are largely members of the diaspora that would be better served protecting their homeland rather than business interests. We would need to negotiate with the assimilation of Sai Sea's seafarer marines in order banners to bolster army's capabilities. Big trouble in Little Kyria. Autumn Blaze still had gotten used to the military battles from the general she entered the room, but she had enough meetings with the Coral River that she was gradually getting used to it. The general self was always kind and friendly, so that didn't bother Autumn, but it was more than the fact that she now found herself involved in military intelligence briefings that threw her off. She never imagined that the military would partially answer to her, yet she also never imagined uh, she'd be in the position where she was a fool. Uh, hello, hello, no, you're not doing anything, you're not repairing. The majority of the realm was quiet, save for a few scuffles with bandits in the west, but the big issue is fragrance, a coral river said, tapping a map of Kyria for emphasis. Paramilitaries who call themselves the Gleaming Scales have bro all but broken out of the gang warfare into the street against a coalition of social and religious forces, including the Way of Fire Mystics and trade unionist movements in fragrance. They're popular with the nationals of the realm and are mostly led by diaspora returnees, which should explain their ideals. The Gleaming Scales seem to have imported uh, uh, Wingbardian fascism almost down to the letter, and trust me, I've been to Wingbardian, I should know. 
Okay, so it sounds like it's time to get the military involved, Autumn said. Why haven't they been dealt with already? Because Fickle Kurt and the NAKP have been using the Gleaming Scales as under-the-table enforcers for the police in Fragrance and Rhapsody, Cora elaborated. They're farther right than the NAKP is, but they aren't afraid to join forces when it suits them both. And so normally going after the Gleaming Scales would be unfeasible because Fickle Kurt and his allies would bail them out. However, there's been a split between the NKAPT, or NK, NAKP, and the Gleaming Scales lately. We could crack down on them, but they are only a fringe movement, and the situation of Fragrance is delicate. Clearing the Malkin and Bold and the other parties to fill the power vacuum, whether that be the Rising Fire or the Trade Unionists, but they're hardly pleasant cure, and they're likely funded by wealthy individuals who don't have our nation's best interests in mind. I'd be lying if I said I'd be sad to see them go. She shrugged and deferred, deferred to Autumn with a bow of her head. At any rate, the decision is not mine to make. That responsibility rests on your shoulders, Premier. Situation fragrance is too delicate to, to disturb. The gloomy scales must be put down before they become even stronger. Hey, who needs political power now? I'm not going to radically hurt our uh, stability here, though. So we're not going to celebrate the Mid-Autumn Festival this year, unfortunately. Which really sucks. We gotta do what we gotta do. Are you repairing at all? No, I want you to repair. Stop. Now go. Today, my friends in a, quest, uh, for a fragrance enterprise and myself met with a questioning delegation of the transfer ship schematics and blueprints into our hooves. While the designs of the ships they gave us were outdated by their standards of fire control systems and battery schematics were similarly antiquated to the modern world, they obsolete, the obsolete three ships were we raised from fragrance harbor to the point where they would only serve as well as training dummies. But this transfer of knowledge wouldn't even be possible without the efforts of a misguided premier in befriending the equestrians. Even though she may be hopelessly outclassed by the requirements of her job, even a broken clock is right twice a day, as they say, the deal is not perfect. Of course, in exchange for these blueprints and schematics, we've had agreed to give a question of prospecting rights for any resources they find in curious, so in exchange for a one-time gift of obsolete knowledge, they have themselves a steady stream of valuable raw materials to siphon out of our nation. This won't hurt us in the short term, as curious is so underdeveloped and improperly exploited, they would not have a lot of resources immediately to hoof on hoof for de delivery. In essence, we're only exchanging a small fraction of the already pitifully small potential in this deal, but we'll be stung in the long term if we don't find a way to renegotiate or renege on this deal if we properly exploit the resources of our lands. A question of gaining an ever-growing share of our material output, sapping us what should be ours by right. While the deal itself went out without any complications, I had an unfortunate encounter with a delegate by the name of Applejack, one of Autumn Blaze's friends and supposedly a member of the so-called Elements of Harmony. I think she's supposed to represent honesty, if I recall correctly, which is a useful trait to have when I'm negotiating a business deal, although I did not care all that much uh, to properly commit it to memory. Magic artifacts are useful tools, but their importance is increasing, increasingly diminishing in a modern era of technology and science. At any rate, the mayor pulled me aside after the meeting and tried to give me a lecture about proper cooperation with the other leaders of the plenum. And although she did not outright say it, she implica implicitly accused me of using the plenum for the benefit of my friends and myself over the benefits of the realm. While she is correct, in the path of modernization I wish to take Kyria on does directly benefit the returning disc of Spora like myself, also stands to greatly benefit the realm as a whole, and cooperation with my colleagues only comes when they meet me halfway. It's not fair for one party to bend over backwards to please an uncompromising partner after all. I did try to explain this to her, but the mayor must be a part donkey. <laughs> that would explain her stubbornness, at least. It does seem that the only system she's willing to accept and understand is that one directly mimics the question model of harmony, and anything else is completely foreign to her. Now at least I understand where Autumn Blaze learned her helpless idealism from. Proper cooperation with my peers still does remind an elusive ideal, I will admit, and not one that I can easily reach. Many of the ideas of the other cliques are simply incompatible with the modern kingdom, particularly the traditional nonsense that Priestess Winter Frost spouts out during every session of the plenum. I cannot afford a compromise with her too much, else I will lose the backing of my followers and supporters. They wish to see a properly modernized kingdom, not one laden with the burdens of outdated religious philosophy, and if I am perceived as to be too weak, then I will be ousted as the NAKP's leader. Even in this, life is like a business, and an incapable executive must be replaced with the good of the company. Only in this case, the company is the country, and I cannot have a weak executive board if it is to prosper and be profitable. I have to be careful to find the right balance between compromise and dissent if I am to steer the fortunes of both Kira and myself to a more profitable tomorrow. Thank you, Fickle Kurt. I don't know why this took so long and so hard for these guys to repair. I do not understand. And then we'll go through Flame and Fury. The Vermilion Banners were once the most feared and professional fighting force in the Eastern Zeprica, but then the science allowed it to decay into a show of its former self. If we are to complete the rebuilding of our magnificent army, we must encourage bravery of our soldiers in the fields. In the field, the innovation of our philosophers behind it. Get more army speed game, which is good. Oh, these schemes. Which be nice. The Tiaos mercenaries. But Winterfrost tongue the inside of her cheek in contemplative thought as she watched the latest ship from Griffonia sail into port. It was a cargo freighter loaded with goods from the Griffin lands, but Winter was more interested in the creatures on it. Some were Griffins, few were ponies, but most were Kirin. They were all employed by the Saisi trading house, one of Kira's oldest, uh, oldest trading houses, yet few of the Kirin on board had ever seen their ancestral homelands. 
Sasuke fled the realm with his business since when the Sans started and maintained his success overseas by employing members of the Kirin diaspora to all sail ships and protect them with their lives. It too was coming home. Just like employees, and Kiri had Fickle Kern to thank for that. Winter herself wasn't as thankful, though, as the rest of the planet about that. Sasuke was brought back but because it had experience of fitting up pirates and protecting its cargo with well-trained seafarer marines, and Kiri had a pri uh, pirate problem on Auburn Isle. Kiri needed the return of Sasuke's business to establish foreign trade and to use the marines just as a stopgap measure until it could train its own army and navy, but this was Fickle Kern's work and everything that Kiri was done did was done with his friend's best interest in his mind, interests that seemed to so frequently overlap with making more money. While the Marines might officially have been placed under the command of the Vermilion Banner Army, Winter doubted that their loyalties moved as quickly as their supposed allegiance. Were these Kirin truly ready to serve their matriarch, or were they still using the Sassy Trading House as creatures? If push came to shove, Winter wasn't sure she wanted to be in the room when the realm found out. One thing was certain she knew, Fickle and the Scrooge were strengthening their own position while addressing the realm's problems. Winter and fellow mystics would have to keep pace if they wanted to keep the heart and soul of Kira firmly devoted to the Concord and her matriarch. Every action we take is a double-edged sword. Three companies will be incorporated in the Vermilion Banner Army. Oh, cool. Reclaim Auburn Isle. So we need you. Here. Nice. Peasant sympathizer, huh? Ranger, engineer, all guard, Karen, heat specialist, arch leader, militia, strategist, peasant sympathizer, Karen, engineer, scavenger. Invader. Claim Auburn Isle. The pirates of Nakod on Auburn Isle have long been a nuisance to the realm. <clears throat> the constant raids along the coastline have destabilized us for too long, and their punishment is overdue. We'll fill forth with our new navy, and our modern army, and put an end to the pirate menace and Nakod. Please, for the love of God, we have to. We could do that, but I'm not gonna, like I said, reduce our stability. What are we looking here? We need trucks. Not ideal. Oh, we're looking for this. Oh, what type of old ships did we get? Oh. That'd be good. Agrarian consolidation would be good. The Triple Waters of Hyacinth. Ships spotted off the port by all gunners at your stations. Fickle Curran, a cloak dug from this book, his sailors scrambled out the steamer, spurred on by the captain's called arms. Sitting aside, the business Kieran climbed up to the top deck, dodging a few sailors hurriedly moving up and down the stairs leading into the ship's hole, and found a spot along the port side of the ship where the marine squinted out over the waters with a frown. Ships? Curran asked him, spotting three outdated junks sailing towards the steamer. Are they pirates? We're close to hi Hyacinth, so I likely, the mariners responded. They're not answering our signals, so they're likely part of the knock on Not to worry, though. Before a gun on the ship can turn all them all into splinters, before we get in range of the muskets and cannons. Fickle nod, his ears flattening uh, as the steamer's forward gun let loose a warning shot to ward off the approaching ships, the shell creating a plume of frothy white water where it landed. As he watched, the junks threw up their black flag, although one barely had, had a chance to raise it to the top of his mast, before a kill shot from the steamer's gun crumpled the wooden hull on, on, on itself. The marines let out a cheer even as the futile musket shot from the surviving junks began to splash the water off the steamer's port side, though. That abruptly stopped when a booming clang ran out, rang out, and the ship lurched to the port, seeing Fickle Kurt tumbling to the side. Submarine, Sylvan Kieran yelled, but it was too late. The submarine had surfaced from directly underneath the steamer, and then from his hatches burst forth a swarm of pirates armed to the teeth with swords and antiquated firearms. Rope flew up over the starboard rails, and the subsequent onslaught from the pirate boarding party overwhelmed the marines, who could only muster token resistance before they lost the deck. Fleeing from the carnage, Fickle stumbled through the steamer's narrow corridors, sighing in relief as he ran into a quartet of sailors armed with rifles and bayonets, prepared to fight on the rear guard action below decks. But hurtling out of the side corridor was a mare garbed in splendid raiment with two swords held aloft in her magic. Falling upon the unprepared sailors with her twirling blades and cutting them down in a flurry of steel. She grinned as Kern tried to stop, slide, tried to sl slide to a stop before he could gallop the other way, spun one of her swords around her in, in her magical grip, and smashed the pommel against the scales under his sword horn. Darkness. So after that one, we're going to do riches of the middle flu. The far branch of the middle flu once carried their exports down its waters to the city of Verdun, where they were organized and recorded before being launched to the rest of the realm as valuable products or to the world as trade goods. The towns along these branches have long since weathered with the collapse of the economy, needing her help to become prosperous once more. The matriarch of the Auburn Isles. Oh, look at all the stuff we have here. That'd be nice. We don't have political power for that. Fickle Kern sat in the corner of his dark cell, wondering how much time had passed since his last meal of stale bread and rice wine. He had awoken in the black abyss, convinced he was dead, and was until the heavy metal door opened for his first meal that had seen any light. But apart from when his slot on the door opened to give him his meals, it was barred shut. 
The walls of the cells were all brick, and the one time he managed to work himself up into enough of a rage to try to tap into the New York taboo to burn a way out of his cell, he could find a flammable weak spot to set fire to. Audi Cops was burning his suit to ashes, and the experience had left him dizzy, disoriented, and sick. Another attempt was off the table. The steps approached, and Current looked up, turning to where he thought the door was supposed to be. Keys turned into the lock, the door was opened, and it squealed on its rusty hinges as it opened outwards. Torchlight blinding the stallion, uh, and he had to cover his face for two moments to let his eyes adjust to the sudden light. When he could see again, uh, he could look up to the Kieran mayor standing over him, and he quickly realized it was the same one who had knocked him out during the ambush. You, he croaked, recalling slightly from her. What do you want? What happened to the crew? To the ship? His response was a biting slap across his slates, hard enough to rattle his teeth together. Quiet and listen, the mayor said, frowning at him. My name is Roaring Fire. The pirates of Arbor Isle stay under my command, and the Kieran of uh, Nakod call me their matriarch and protector. I come here to bargain. Roaring fire gestured vaguely to the outside world. Your friends and fragrance paid your ransom, so I'm letting you go. A ship will take you back to Hyacinth, while your navy's waiting to put its hoof to my neck and break the back of my armada. That's a fight I cannot win, but I know you are also starting a fight you cannot win. So if I want to make a deal. She squatted down and thought her next words over carefully, the jewelry in her mane jingling faintly in the darkness of the cell. I don't have, have buccaneers, I have spies. I know what you want, I know that the NAKP... Uh, is training paramilitaries and preparing for the worst. And should the worst come to pass, would it be better to have more friends on your side than enemies? She dug through her robes and pulled out a white candle with a jade wick. This candle has been enchanted by fire Dragonfire. Burn a message in it, and I will receive it. Your navy will take the Auburn Isles, but they will not find my armada here. But rest assured, I'll answer the call when you need me. Release me and you take a ransom, but you will have no help from me. I'm a stand of good business, and I know when a business is on... Ooh, deals on the table. I want this one, but no dealings with scoundrels. It only took Curran a few moments <clears throat> to make up his mind. As he took up the candle from the roaring fire, snapped it into two with his magic before crushing the wax to the ground. I'm a proud son of fragrance, he could proclaim, sternly scowling at roaring fire. I'm a reputable business, Karen, and I will not stoop so low as to consorting with a criminal scum to get what I need. I do not need you, so I will not dirty myself with your help. Roaring fire bared her teeth, and red flames began to look at the edges of her mane. Her eyes turned piercing wide, and her teeth elongated into a vicious daggers as her rage started to consume her. Insolent fool, she growled, her voice taking on a demonic edge. As she slipped closer to the New York State, I should flay you alive, hammers and nails under your scales, and peel them off one by one. You know, you will know pain when I am through with you. But Kern stood his ground. You do not dare hurt me, he stated. If you lay a hoof on me, your model will be hunted down to the ends of the earth. You can flee from Nacker, but my friends will make sure every single one of your ships is found and sunk, and every single one of your pirates is executed for the crimes. Uh, face it, the age of piracy is over. You are a dying breed, a last gap of lawless time, but I am the face of law and order, and Kyria, I am the face of your problems. And now I'm the face of progress. I'm the face of the future, and the future does not need you anymore. He stood up and looked down at uh, his muzzle at the angry pirate captain before him. You gambled everything on this, didn't you? He asked her. You wanted to kidnap me to try and convince me of my own desperation so you could make a career change and my, be my mercenaries? We don't need more undisciplined pirate. I will know you will not save yourself this way. The only way you will save yourself is to let me go, take a ransom, and start and try to start again somewhere else. I know it, you know it. Now stop dancing around the point sh anymore, shall we? Even after all that, the current still harbored a little worry at seeing the half-transformed Nerek in front of him. But in a few moments, the flames went out, and the roaring fire returned to her Karen form. Fine, she spat. Turning away from him, have your way then. Pray that you never see me again, Kurt, because you do not want to see what happens when you trap a pirate like a caged animal. The pirates of Arbonau are caged animals, and it's our duty to put them down. Hey! That helped us out. Yay! Too bad we can't still do the thing there. Oh. Yeah, Rich of the Melifloom will be important to do. Uh, are there any factories we get down here at all? No? I mean, there's one two up here which we do have to have. Land reorganization, much of the realm's lands fall into one of two categories, unpopular bastions of the nature, or sprawling subsistence farms. By concentrating our efforts on reorganizing a farmland and making inroads to untapped nature reserves, we can greatly expand the amount of available land we have for building projects, allowing us to increase the density of our growing industrial base. The capture of Auburn Isle. Fickle current watched from the bow of an armored junk as a fragrant full tail steamed into Knacker's Harbor, and their marines quickly seizing control of the docks and allowing the large troop transports to dock and disgorge their troops. But he soon realized there was no fight to be had. The pirates were already long gone, just as Roaring Flame had promised, and not a shot was fired in the capture of the island. The prancing Kieran banner of the Vermilion Realm soon replaced the black flag hanging from the flagpole in the center of Knacker, and the marines let out a cheer while the townsfolk unsullenly watched their home fall to the invaders with their once mighty pirate armada, having abandoned them. Guess even pirates know when the fight's lost, the junk captain remarked to Kurt from his side. Smart move on their part. The flotilla would have broken the fleet into driftwood, even if they had a submarine hiding in it. Without the base in Nacker, the armada's going to fracture and weather away. We'll have a couple more raids, I'm sure, but the glory days are done. Uh, Kurt silently nodded along, remembered the offer Roaring Fire made on him and how he spurned it. She'd been enraged and it had nearly turned Nerek on him, but enough common sense to realize that she, when she was beat, and cut her losses and run. He'd already even seen the last of her, but even if he hadn't, it wouldn't be too long before some Kurt did her in. The captain was right, without an accurate supply armada. Roaring Fire's days were numbered, and hers and the rest of the pirate brethren. It was another victory for the NAKP, and the realm as a whole. 
Abernau belongs to the realm once more. Fantastic. The pirates of Abernau will occasionally launch raids on the Cairn mainland. Well, they shouldn't anymore. Literally should not anymore. Nashville's takeover. In Epigraphia. Oh boy. And then we'll do land repossessions in the northern industry. Entitle entitlements. Have I been replaced? Fickle currency seething as he tosses briefcase on a separate snow's desk in outrage. I was gone for two weeks. Two weeks. And my reserve seat as chief advisor of the Matrix has been fulfilled. I demand that it be returned to me. It is my right as a chair Kieran of the NAKP. Severus flinched back and tapped his hooves together, noting the partial elongation of Kern's fangs and the smoky bick uh, flickering of his mane as rage threatened to overwhelm him. Breathe, Kern. Cypress began gently placing hoop down on his desk. Remember our exercises. The New York State is unbefitting Kern like ourselves. As Kern slowly calmed himself down, Cypress continued trying to soothe his former student's hurt pride. You are still the leader of the NAKP and the Morning Secretariat. No Kern is going to take that from you. Your party believes in you, and you have our absolute loyalty at any rate. The appointment is not something that we can undo. Rain Shine's advisors are appointed and dismissed at her leisure. Give her time, state your case, and you may find yourself back by a right hoof in no time. It should never been happening in, my, happen in the first place, Kern said. Uh, my authority is built on my skills and my value. What does that say about me and the NAKP if I'm so easily replaced? I cannot hold our party together without the legal authority that comes from being Rainshine's right hoof. I must have my seat back, or Kira will move on without me. Matriarch is satisfied, satisfied with the current advisor. Fickle Kern has restored his uh, advisor position. He's been gone for a long time, so I don't know what you're talking about, boy. No, it just became June! Uh, we don't have enough, anyways, whatever. Uh, so that means not bad. I, I don't mind uh, maybe just reply to letters anyways. That might actually be worth it then. Because we need 40 factories here. Industrializing society active, huh? Keep building us up. That would be fantastic. So can you be normal and just train? You get injured, it's okay. Just go back. Yeah, this one's important to do too. Separate complexes, very nice. Long day inventor. Produce as much as you possibly can. We're doing okay. Last level more political power, but we'll get more weekly stability anyways. It's going up by 0.7, which is great. Urban rural, uh, a rural urban migration. When Brown uh, Bore had first moved to Fragrance from abroad just after the silence was lifted, her heart had gone out to the poor city Kieran that she found there, destitute. Grounded by the silence, they scratched out a living wherever they could see, could and struggled to earn their daily rights. As the Kieran in the country could feed themselves, she mused. Bitterly, she lowered the morning's typeset into a cankerous little printing press. She quite a scathing pamphlet to print today, and would need to take the press apart and hide it before she hid the, hid the streets to distribute. In the past month, Blenheim's latest decrees about agrarian consolidation had taken a hard toll on fragrance. Every day, caravans of poor farmers whose land had been bought out by the state wandered into fragrance, having been promised jobs, homes, and all the amenities of modern city. What they found was increasingly overcrowded, and dirty slums still struggling to recover the same as everywhere else. Brown Bore had interviewed Kieran across the city in the past week, and the verdict was clear. Perhaps modern as the countryside was important, but fragrance was buckling under the strain of its new arrivals. Outside her window, she could still hear an argument about some merchants' outrageous prices. Rents were rising, the cost of food was not far behind. Her article was an open, anonymous letter to the NAKP. And, uh, to Mayor Cherry Blossom, demanding that they take immediate action to feed, clothe, and house the masses streaming into the city. If measures were not announced, her letter called for protests blocking uh, a city's wars for an afternoon. How busy the reopen port was getting, just even after an afternoon's disruption would surely get the attention of Fragrance's masses sorely needed. Whether any Kieran would actually show up, well, she had to be hopeful that the city's unfortunates would be willing to stand up for themselves. The shouts outside Borei's window grew louder, and she could hear her mother pleading that she had Philly's defeat. The sound of the press whirling to life drowned her out. They're emptying the countryside faster than the cities can handle. And repossessions are done. Verna Manufactories. The city of Verdun has proven to be a fertile ground for the growth of modernization in the realm. With an abundance of labor and room to expand, the working class of Verdant is growing faster than perhaps anywhere else in Kyria. But with all the new labor comes the spread of new and radical ideas, and the workers that build factories today may get ideas about taking them back tomorrow. Ooh. Uh, we definitely want this one too. So as much as I want to do, we do need to do agrarian consolidation as well. So, do we have any issues here? No? I think we'll end it there. We're doing really well. Um, I think we're actually progressing faster than when I did this the first time. So hopefully we do this, uh, you know, in three and a half years, and uh, our industries hopefully we have a small science base, but we need to have 
industrializing society at the very least. So, hey, if you enjoyed the video, though, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And see you tomorrow, where we might actually be able to complete the three and a half year plan with a grand gallop onwards. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.